Amen. All right, Judges chapter 14. So we're starting the life of Samson. So in Judges chapter 13, uh, we remember the angel coming to Samson's father and mother and, and basically prophesying you know, the birth of Samson. We talked about how Samson would be a Nazarite from the womb. He was to have, you know, he was to be born into the Nazarite vow. We looked at what the Nazarite vow is in the book of Numbers. We looked at what that meant. That's going to come into play a little bit um, this evening. But um, we see that, you know, Samson was a Nazarite from, he, what we saw the prophecy of his life in Judges chapter 13. For the next three chapters, Judges 14, 15, and 16, we're going to look at Samson's actual life and how he prosecuted his life, you know, as, uh, you know, one of the most famous judges in the book of Judges. So it's interesting, though, because between Judges 13 and Judges 14, we see that, you know, Samson kind of comes into the picture, you know, he was just born in Judges chapter 13 at the end, and then it comes into the picture, he's, he's a young adult. He's already um, grown up, and he's looking to get married at that point. So we don't really see how Samson was raised. We don't see how he was raised as a child in uh, between Judges 13 and 14, but we can pick up some clues. We can pick up some clues throughout um, Samson's life, and especially in Judges chapter 14. So look at Judges chapter 14 in verse number 1. He's been raised. He's a young adult now. We don't know how he was raised, but let's get some clues here as we read Judges chapter 14. And when Samson went down to Timnath, and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. So he goes down and he sees, he's, he's down in this Philistine city amongst these Philistine people, and he sees a woman of the daughters of the Philistines, in verse number 2, and he came up and told his father and mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me to wife. So a couple of things, first of all, to notice here. First of all, it doesn't say that he knew her. It doesn't say that he met her, that he talked to her, that, you know, he loved her or anything. It says he saw her twice. Okay, so it says he saw this woman, and he goes back to his, his parents, and he says, get her for me. Okay, so first of all, um, look at verse number three. He sees something, so that's the first point I want to kind of point out. He sees something, and he says, I want it. And he goes and he tells his parents, get it for me. Okay, look at verse number three. Then his father and mother said unto him. So here they're going to say to him, they're going to say, you know, why are you going and looking for a wife amongst the Philistines? I mean, the Philistines, they are not Jews. They are not, they are not um, the Israelites. They are not, you know, they do not worship the one true God. They are heathens. You know, Dagon and all these false gods and idol worshipers. They're very violent people. And they're actually oppressing Israel at this time. And look at verse number 3. Then his father and mother said unto him, Is there never a woman? I mean, that kind of implies that, you know, this is not the first time that Samson has, you know, pointed out a, a woman of, you know, some other nation. Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Thank you, Father, for the good advice. Let me rethink what I'm doing here. Thanks, Dad. No, look what he says. And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. So twice, he just orders his parents to just, you know, get me what I want, basically. So look, apparently, we can already kind of see that Samson has been raised here to realize or to think that he's, he's special. Okay, so apparently this angel, you know, coming to, you know, his mother and his father, you know, saying that this is going to be special and he's going to be a Nazarite from the womb and he's going to do these great things. Apparently that has, you know, not been portrayed in a humble way to Samson by his parents. We kind of have a, a spoiled type situation here. I mean, he orders his parents around like they're servants here. Okay, I mean, it, it, he has no respect for them. It reminds me, it reminds me, have you ever seen these kids that call their parents by their first name. <laughs> I mean, if I had ever, you know, if I had to call my dad by his first name, I mean, I'm sure I could have done it, but then I'd have been laying on the ground bleeding. You know what I mean? It, it's like you just, it's shocking when you see that kind of thing because it's just such a lack of respect, you know. But you'll see five-year-old kids just like hollering at their parents by their first name. You see that today. That kind of, when I read this, that's what it reminds me of. He just has no respect for his parents. He orders them around like they're his servants. So obviously Samson knows who, that he's somebody special at this point, and he's been raised, you know, 
His parents are probably even older at this point. He's a young man. His parents are probably older people, which makes it um, even worse. But look at verse number 4. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So the Philistines were persecuting Israel, the Bible says. That we saw that in, in, verse, or in, in chapter 13. Then Samson went down and his father and mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him. Turn back to Numbers chapter 6. So we see something else here. We see a, for another clue here uh, about Samson, how he was raised, and how Samson is, is prosecuting his life. You know, you kind of have to look at these clues in the Bible and realize that, you know, nothing's really put in the Bible by accident, okay? Samson went down and he came, you know, through these vineyards to the vineyards of Timnath, either where he met this woman or saw this woman, you know, but first of all, what's he doing walking around in the vineyards of Timnath in the first place? I mean, the guy is a Nazarite from the womb. Look at number six and verse number, thir verse number three. The Bible says, again, this is recap from last week, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes nor eat moist grapes or dried. So he's to have, he's to have nothing to eat or drink from a vine at all. And yet he's hanging out in a vineyard. Okay, He's walking through a vineyard here. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the husk. We'll go back to Judges chapter 14. So he's going through the vineyards meeting, meeting, you know, meeting women, okay, meeting this woman, or seeing this woman. It doesn't even say that he's, he's met her or talked to her. Look at verse number 6. And the Spirit of, of the Lord, so then he runs into this lion, okay, so we're going to see another problem. So we see that he's in the vineyards, and then we're going to see this lion that comes along, and look at, at verse number 6, and a young lion roared against him. It means it came after him, attacked him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. That's, a, that's like a goat, a small, a small goat, okay, a kid. And he had nothing, you know, he's basically like, he, he tore this lion up like he would have torn up a lamb. Okay, I mean, a lamb, a kid, is like this big. I mean, lambs, when they're born, are like seven pounds. They're tiny. And it says that he tore the, the, or the, the lion up like, he, he, you, like you could tear up a, a lamb, okay, or a kid. And he had nothing in his hand. With his bare hands he did this. But he told not his father or mother what he had done. So he kills a lion with his bare hands. Okay, so first of all we see, I mean look, I mean, that's not normal. Okay, I don't know how many of you have ever been in like a fight with an animal before. Okay, we used to have, we used to have these, these Great Pyrenees dogs. I'm going to tell another dog story, okay. So we had these Great Pyrenees dogs, they were like 150 pounds. They were, they were protectors of the, the flock of sheep. But these dogs were huge. They were huge, they were good at their jobs, and they were dumb. And they kept getting into porcupines. And everything that they would see, they, had to, they thought they had to kill. So they get, one of them just wouldn't stop getting into porcupines. I thought I was just going to have to shoot him. Because it's like he just wouldn't stop getting into porcupines. He'd come back to the house after a night of running around or whatever, and you just have a face full of quills, a mouth full of quills. It's a 150-pound wolf, basically, is what this is. So you know what we had to do? It took three of us to hold this dog. We'd take him into the barn or the garage and we would set him into the corner and I would lay on his front legs as he's on his side. Garrett would lay on his back legs and my wife would pull the quills out with a, with a Leatherman. And we did that, I don't even know how many times. A lot. My wife loved it. <laughs> but the point is, it took three of us to hold this dog down. There's no way one of us could have, could have held this dog down. To do this. Samson kills a lion with his bare hands. What I'm trying to get you to understand, there's, there's supernatural strength going on here. Okay, so this is not normal for a man to be this strong. Okay, it's the first indication that we see of Samson's greater than normal or, you know, super normal, whatever you want to call it, strength. Okay, look at verse number seven. Look at verse number seven. So he kills this lion Okay, he kills this lion, and then the Bible says in verse 7, and he went down and, he, and talked with the woman. Well, okay, at least he talked to her now. And she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. So now the lion has been laying there, and it's rotting, it's dead. And behold, there was a swarm of bees, 
and honey in the carcass of the lion. So inside the lion, like it doesn't take long for a, a body of an animal to rot away, be eaten away by wild animals or whatever. And this, these bees made a, a honeycomb inside this, this carcass. And he took thereof in his hands, turn back to Numbers chapter 6, he took therefore in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and he gave them. And so he took the honey out of the carcass and they did eat. But he told them not that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Well, that, you know, thank you, right? I mean, thanks for the honey, but hey, I got it in some rotting carcass of an animal. You know, I wouldn't want to know that part, right? So he doesn't tell his parents. But look at Numbers chapter 6. Look at Numbers chapter 6. Again, we see that Samson is just not taking this Nazarite vow thing, like, seriously at all. Look at number 6. The Bible says, All the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. Turn to Leviticus chapter 5. You say, yeah, but it was an animal, not a man. And in, in Numbers chapter 6, it's talking about a man. Well, it's really talking about, you know, being unclean. Okay, look at Leviticus chapter 5. Look at Leviticus chapter 5 and verse number 2, where the Bible says this, Or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast, or a carcass of unclean cattle, or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and if it be hidden from him, he shall also be unclean and guilty. So Leviticus 5 is teaching some some rules, some, some, kind of, some cleanliness rules about being unclean, touching dead animals, touching dead you know, bodies, all these types of things, and what makes somebody unclean. Okay, So in Leviticus chapter 11, just a few verses down, so it says, look, if you touch the carcass of an unclean animal, you're, you are unclean. That's what the Bible is saying. Okay, So let's look at what an unclean animal is. In Leviticus chapter 11, in verse number 27, we see that an unclean animal, we see the lion is covered in Leviticus chapter 11 and verse number 27. It says, And whatsoever goeth upon his paws among all manner of beasts that go on all four, those are unclean to you. Whoso toucheth their carcass shall be unclean until the even. And he that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean till the even. They are unclean unto you. So, I mean, here in Leviticus it's talking about what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat, and it's talking about what you should touch and what you shouldn't touch as far as the dead carcass. So look, the lion went upon its paws. The lion was an unclean animal, and Samson was eating, eating out of his carcass. He wasn't just touching the carcass. He was literally eating out of the carcass of this animal. He's not really taking the Nazarite vow thing super seriously in his life. Okay, those are the first two indications that we see of that, you know, that he's not, you know, he's not really following the Nazarite vow. Go back to Judges chapter 14. So we see, what do we see so far? We see he's kind of a, he's kind of a spoiled brat. He's kind of, you know, he's disrespectful to his parents. He, he sees something and he just wants it. And he's not really prosecuting the Nazarite vow like the angel said that he should do. Look at Judges 14.10. The Bible says, So his father went down unto the woman, and Samson made there a feast, for so used the young men to do. And it came to pass when they saw him that they brought thirty companions to be with him. So Samson was probably not broke. I mean, he was a, you know, a high you know, leader um, in his country, and you know, he basically hires a bunch of friends here, or somebody hired him a bunch of friends. So they basically brought thirty companions to be with him at this um, at this wedding feast. Okay, verse number 12. And Samson, now here's where it gets interesting. And Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you. If ye can certainly declare it me within seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 changes of garments. But if ye cannot declare it to me, then ye shall give me 30 sheets and 30 change of garments. Then they said unto him, Put forth thy riddle that we may hear it. So, I mean, first of all, I mean, the first part of verse 12 seems fine. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I like a good riddle. I love riddles. But it kind of turns into like a gambling bet here yeah. is the problem, okay? So they start, basically, they're at this wedding. Samson is, you know, he supposedly wanted this woman so bad, and he immediately gets into this gambling deal with these 30, you know, people that were hired by somebody to be his friends. Okay, and we'll see how good of friends they turn out to be. Okay, so they're basically, they're gambling. They're gambling on this riddle, which is really, you know, it's, I mean, 
it, it's a trick by Samson because it's an impossible riddle for, for them to get. You know, they would never be able to guess this riddle. And he said unto them, verse 14, Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they could not in three days expound the riddle. So here they had seven days to get through this riddle, or they're going to lose 30 changes of garments. Which, you know, that was an expensive thing back then. Clothing was expensive. Verse 15, And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband, that he may declare unto this, us this riddle. Please, please, will you ask your husband, please, if he could tell us the riddle? But they kind of took it a little further than that. They said, Lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire. Have ye called us to take that we have? Is it not, is it not so? So they basically, they basically come to his wife and they threaten her life and the life of her family if she doesn't find out the riddle. Find out from your new husband. You know, I mean, first of all, you can kind of tell, I mean, let's just go to verse 16 and then I'll, I'll pause for a minute and analyze this situation. But look, you say, oh, poor Samson's wife. Poor Philistine gal here, right? Well, I mean, she's not so innocent either. Look at Samson's wife in verse 16. And Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost but hate me, and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people, and hast not told it to me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father nor my mother, and shall I tell it thee? So basically, she doesn't come, she's not honest with her husband. You know, she's not honest with Samson. You know, it's clear, for, she's, use, she's using manipulation here. She's manipulating him. And by the way, women don't ever do this with your husbands. Not that you ever would, but don't ever be this wife that is like, oh, you know, if you don't do that and use this extreme language, if you don't let me do this or, you know, whatever, you don't love me or you must hate me or some kind of extreme language like this. You know, it's, it's a form of manipulation. And that is what Samson's wife was doing to him here is she was manipulating him. Look, it's clear that Samson's heart is not knit to hers and her heart is not knit to his. We'll get to that in a little bit. But it's clear that their hearts are not knit together here. Okay, I mean, look, th this is a shallow relationship. And I'll define it for you a little bit better later. But she could have just went if she was honest and, you know, she trusted her husband and he trusted her. She could have just went to him and said, look, these people have threatened to kill me. These people have threatened to kill my family if, you know, you know, and I'm sure Samson would have taken care of the problem. I mean, it's Samson. I mean, come on. You know, so she wasn't honest. She manipulated Samson, and she cried, and she wept, and she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted, verse 17, and, and it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her. So she just, she breaks him down. She breaks him down, and he tells her because she lay sore upon him, and she told the riddle to the children of her people. So she breaks him down, he tells her, and she immediately tells the 30 people. And the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey? So honey was the answer, and what is stronger than a lion? So honey and a lion were the answer. Now nobody could have got that, because nobody knew that Samson killed the lion with his bare hands, nobody saw that. He ate the honey out of the carcass. Nobody saw that. And he said unto them, If ye had not plowed with my heifer. So, I mean, he basically said, he doesn't say, Look, did you, did you um, pressure my, my new wife? Because I'm really upset that you've pressured her and threatened her. No, he's like, If you've not plowed with my heifer. Okay, I mean, look, th there's, there's not a lot of respect for his new wife going on here either. Okay, he says, If ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. So first, you know, it's just not a great relationship start here between Samson and his new wife. Okay, there's not, there's not a lot of love and trust going on here from either side. Okay, I mean, this thing was doomed from the beginning. Okay, <laughs> from either side. She lies to him. She says he's sad, you know, that he won't tell her. She deceives him, manipulates him. And, you know, he didn't have a lot of respect or concern for her either. Okay, he treats her basically, I mean, you know, if you're not plowed with my heifer, that's him treating her like a piece of property. That's, that's how he's speaking about her. Okay? So, I mean, they threatened her. You know, they said, lest we burn thee and thy house, thy father's house with fire. Look at verse 19. So Samson, he's lost. He's lost the bet. 
one way or another, I mean, they cheated, but he lost. They figured it out. Verse 19, the Bible says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon. Now, if you remember, Gaza, Ekron, Gath, all these are, the Ashkelon, these are Philistine cities. These are Philistine cities to the west of Israel. And he goes to Ashkelon, that's kind of to the southwest, and slew 30 men of them, and took their spoil, and gave the change of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. So look, I mean, he paid the bet. I mean, he went and murdered 30 people, and then he paid the bet. So, I mean, it was kind of, you know, he basically goes and he kills 30 Philistines, takes their clothes, and then gives them to these 30 Philistines that came to his wedding, okay? So, I mean, what, what can you say about this? First of all, you know, look at verse number 20. This is how it ends. In verse number 20, but Samson's wife was given to his companion, whom he had used as his friend. So, I mean, the end of the story shows, I mean, first of all, gambling, I mean, it, it, the whole story shows you that gambling is, is not really a harmless exercise. Okay, I mean, even, look, even bets among friends, I don't know how many times I've seen this, but bets among friends have the ability to cause great resentment and problems. First of all, I mean, this, this is extreme, this story, but look at this bet, look at this bet. Both sides wanted to win so badly that they were willing to kill over it. They were willing to murder people over this bet. Both sides were from the beginning. The, the Philistines were willing to murder this woman and her whole family, and Samson was just going to murder 30 you know, Philistines and you know, give, pay the bet should he lose. He probably never thought um, that he would lose. But just on the idea of betting, just a little side note before we get into the rest of the sermon. I mean, just think of the stupidity of betting, especially amongst friends. I mean, you, you can't really win. Because look, first of all, if you lose, if, if you lose, you lose all your money, and then you're upset. But then, if you win, you've taken your friend's money. I mean, what kind of friends are these? Right? I mean, obviously we see that these weren't really friends um, in Samson, but pe look, people are constantly betting amongst friends today. I mean, all this fantasy football stuff, all these, you know, these card games people are playing, you know, uh, you know on, on the weekends or whatever. I mean, they're just taking each other's money. Nobody's winning there. Nobody's winning. Somebody's always going away. Uh, and look, there are always hard feelings. There are always hard feelings in those situations. You know, you think about, I mean, think about the bigger picture of gambling with casinos and just the whole gambling in industry. I mean, this one is a phenomena that just I, I don't really understand. Because, I mean, why, I mean, think about this. Why would you give someone your business that hates you? Think about that. You would never do that with any other business. You would never go to a furniture store if you walk in there and they just hate you. And they're just, you know, they're just mean to you and they just hate you and they would just like to see you die. You would never do that. I mean, it would be... It would be crazy to even think about doing that. But with casinos, that's exactly what people are doing. You say, what? He's like, they don't hate you there. They don't hate you at the casino. What are you talking about? Everyone's so nice to you there. Everyone's so nice to you at the casino. What are you talking about? Look, think about this. You could work your whole life. You could work for 40 years. You could work for 45 years. You could save up $500,000 or you know, $750,000, a lot of money you could save up. You could build a business over that time, and you could just toil and toil and toil. Maybe it's the family business. Maybe your children help you build that business. Your children's children work in that business. Then you could go into a casino, and you could lose all that money in one hour. Can you, th I mean, have you heard these stories before? I've heard of these stories before. You could lose 40 years. You could lose a lifetime's worth of living in one hour. And then you could go and you could kill yourself because you're so depressed. And you know what? They won't care. They won't care. You could go and say, I'm so depressed. I worked for 50 years for that money. Could you please you know, ha give me my money back? They'll say, get out of here. They'll call the police and they'll throw you out. Look, the casinos, look, the casinos aren't nice big, huge, multi-billion dollar buildings because they're losing money to people. They're, they're going to they're take all your money. 
And they don't care. They don't care how hard you work for it. They don't care, you know, how long it took you to get that money. Look, they hate you. Right. All these billboards where everyone's all, it's all a lie. It's all a lie. All these young, good-looking people, they're all like, winning. <laughs> you know, I, I always tell the kids, I'm like, yeah, they're not going to show that guy jumping off the roof of the casino. You know, after he loses his whole life save, savings. I mean, the numbers in the United States are pretty crazy. I looked it up. It's like, you know, typically people will go to a casino and just blow some money, but 3.5% of people, they say, have an addiction that will basically destroy their life. I mean, that's not a small number. 3.5% of people, you know, and look, the addiction, you know what it is? Let me just figure it out for you. It's greed. That's what it is. It's uncontrolled greed. It's unchecked greed. It's, it's people with no self-control when it comes to greed. And they ruin their whole life. And those people, they'll let you do it. They'll take every penny you have. And then when you want it back or you want to undo it, they'll, they'll throw you out. And they won't let you back in. They hate you. And even if you win in a casino, by the way, everyone, oh, I'm taking the evil casino's money. No, you're not. You're taking the guy's money who's going to go jump off the roof. That's whose money you're taking. You say, I'm really good at cards. Yeah, I'm really good. I can, you know, count cards or whatever. Okay, good job. You're taking somebody's money. He's going to go kill himself. Have a nice day. Good luck, Christian. Let me know how, you're, how good you are, you know, spending that money and how God blesses your life with that money. No way. It's not going to work for you. It's not going to work for you. The casinos don't look like that because they lose. Few things are stupider, in my mind, than this. I mean, it, it's hard. It's hard going out there and working and making a living. So, look, we see in this story people were actually killed over a bet. I mean, people were, were killed over a bet. Samson lost his wife here over money, over greed, probably some pride in there. He lost his wife over it. So let's look at now, now that we've covered that, we've covered the story of Samson's you know, attempted marriage here, or his marriage, I guess you could call it a marriage. Um, his wife was given away. But let's, let's look at Samson's, you know, relationships. And let's take some relationship advice from Samson this evening. Now look, teenagers, young people, I've said this before, but the decisions that you make now, see, it's much, bad decisions are much worse for you than they are for me, okay? Because the decisions that you make now are going to echo throughout your entire life. The decisions on, on, you know, what you do for a living and all these decisions and, and if you get into sin and you get bad habits, that's why we're going through the good habits series. You need to get some good habits as young people. Otherwise, you're going to carry these things and they're going to echo throughout your entire life. Okay, if I serve the Lord until I'm 60 and then, you know, I get backslidden when I'm 60. Look, I'm not going to get backslidden when I'm 60. Okay, but if I get backslidden when I'm 60... You know, then, you know, it's, it's much less damaging to I me. Mean, my kids are raised at that point. Maybe even my grandkids are raised or partially raised at that point. But look, if you start getting into bad things and make bad decisions as a teenager, it could define your entire life. It could define your entire, entire life. So let's just, I mean, if you're under 25 right now, let's take a poll. Who, let's raise your hand if you want a miserable life. Anybody? Raise your hand if you want a miserable life. So let's look at some, some, some relationship do's and don'ts from Samson here, okay? So first of all, Samson was a spoiled brat. Here's another reason, parents, you don't want to raise a spoiled brat. Because you say, oh, you know, they scream in the grocery store. Or they just want candy and all this kind of stuff. Well, it's going to cause major problems later in their life. And this is one of them. So look, spoiled kids, first of all, they will lack self-control. They will lack self-control. Living a life, just pointing at something and wanting it right now, I mean, that is, is someone that is going to be a disaster in their life. If your kids grow up to be that way, it's, it was, look, it was Samson with this woman. He saw something he liked, and he said, I want her. Get her for me. I mean, it gets worse later in life as your kids grow up. You know, it might begin with small things, though. You know, toys, candy, whatever. And especially when a boy matures, by the way, this may actually turn into a relationship issue with women like Samson had here. It didn't look, it didn't matter 
Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. It didn't matter to him that this woman was a Philistine. Should it have mattered? Turn to Deut Deuteronomy chapter 7. This woman was a, was a heathen. This is how I know. This is how I know that Samson wasn't looking for a spiritual wife. He wasn't looking for a, a, a godly partner to walk through life with him. This is how I know exactly what Samson was looking for when he saw this Philistine woman and he said, get her for me. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse number 1. Because Samson would have known this. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when thy Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. See, they couldn't utterly destroy the Philistines. The Philistines were too strong. And they shall make no covenant with them, or show no mercy unto them. Or they just they didn't have enough faith, maybe, to, to just pursue the Philistines to the end. And the Philistines were a constant thorn in the side of the Israelites. It says, make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. In verse number 3, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shalt, thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. They were to have nothing to do with these people. They were to utterly destroy them, and they especially, God warns them, do not marry into them. And Samson is just like, whatever. So look, as children mature, as children mature, and teenagers, as you grow older, the, the choice on who you marry needs to be based on more than, you know, what you want in the flesh. Look at verse number one. What was Samson? What was Samson looking at here? Verse number one. And Samson went down and saw a woman in Timnath, and he came up and told his father in verse number two, "I have seen a woman. Look, she probably was good looking. That's that's what it says. He saw this woman, and he's like, I want to marry her. It had no spiritual connotation at all. She's a Philistine. Turn to First Peter chapter three. But God warned against this." Look, there is more than choosing. So we're learning what not to do from Samson here. So here comes the doctrine on top of the Bible story. Remember our, our methodology? 1 Peter chapter 3. There's more, than, there's more to choosing a wife or even a spouse in general than the outward appearance, the Bible says. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 is talking about, it, it's describing a godly wife. So young men, if you're looking for a godly wife, here you go. It says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So the first thing I want to point out is the, the direction to the conversation of the wives. In verse number two, it says the, the word again. While they behold your chaste what? Chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of hair and of wearing of gold and putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. So here we see that a godly wife, a godly woman, is described as having, you know, chaste conversation. What are you looking for in a wife, single men? What are you looking for in a wife? Are you watching for chaste conversation. Men, young men, is that what you're watching for? Is that what you're looking for? Are you listening to the conversation of young ladies and saying, you know, um, I'm listening for a, a young lady with chaste conversation? Is that what you're looking for? Ladies, young ladies, how's your conversation? Is it chaste? You know what chaste means? Chaste means pure. When you're talking and you're fellowshipping and, and you're you know, hanging out, are you, do you have chaste conversation? Do you have pure conversation? Because the Bible says that that's what a godly man will be looking for. You say, well, no, no man that I know um, would value that. Well, there, then you're not, you're not finding a godly man. Because a godly man will be looking for that chaste conversation. Ladies, your entire future depends on your conversation. Single ladies. You see how we can narrow down 
these things that matter so much? Turn to Proverbs chapter 31. Your entire future. Who wants a miserable life? Who wants a great life? Who wants a great and happy and joyful life and joyful marriage? Look at Proverbs 31 and verse 26. Talking about the virtuous woman. What does the Bible say? Again, pointing to what? The Bible says she opened her mouth to blabber and talk about a bunch of worldly garbage. No, she opened her mouth with wisdom. When she opens her mouth, she opens her mouth with wisdom. You say, but you're a young lady, and you say, well, I don't have any wisdom. Well, 1 Peter chapter 3 also talks about a meek and quiet spirit. You say, oh, you're telling women to be quiet. No, I do this all the time. You know how many times I'm in a room full of men, and there's, there's men just talking like crazy, and everyone's trying to talk over somebody else, and you know what I do? I just shut up. If I have nothing valuable to add to the conversation, if I have no... Oh, let's, say that, let's say that I know the answer, because many times I do. But there's seven other guys saying the answer. Why do I need to say anything? I can just be quiet. I'm just quiet. And then guess what? When you don't know the answer and you're quiet, people think you're smart. Even if you don't know. Works. Look, so if you don't have any wisdom, if you don't have any chaste conversation, your default, be quiet. That's it. But look, the Bible says here that this is what a godly man will be looking for. Samson didn't care. Samson saw something. Samson, the spoiled boy. If you raise a boy like Samson, spoiled, with no self-control, this is who he'll choose. He'll choose a Philistine woman. He'll see a woman and said, you know, he'll just... And then, you know, there's his life. So look, what comes out of your mouths, ladies, the words, look, for women, I mean, literally, literally what the Bible is saying here, that the things that you say will define the type of husband you marry. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, there are men out there looking for a godly wife. And if you talk about, look, ladies, if you talk about nothing but worldly things all the time, look, you do what you want. You do what you want. You talk about worldly things all the time. You talk about nothing but, you know, just, you know, silliness and worldly things, and you're not meek and quiet. You know what you're going to attract? You're going to attract a Samson, is what you're going to attract. And, and, and there, that's how you wreck your life. This woman wrecked her life by yoking up with Samson in like the first five minutes. So, young people, I mean, Listen up. There's a lot. There's a lot to learn here. I mean, I've seen this happen so many times to, to young men and young women. You know, all these, you know, these women talking about Mr. Right. You know, i got to find Mr. Right. The guy's talking about meeting the perfect girl. Look, but the sad, the sad fact is this. The sad fact is this. That, that godly man, if you don't you know, have chaste conversation, that godly man will walk in and he will look right past you. He will be looking, you know, I mean, the godly, chaste young man that's ready to support a family and be a great spiritual leader to his family. And what are you? A, a worldly young lady constantly talking about worldly things. He's going to recognize that right away. Right away. You know, yapping up a storm about, you know, things that have nothing to do with the spiritual life whatsoever. It, he's going to look right past you. See, the problem with kids today, the problem with young people today, is they're looking in the wrong direction. They're all, they're all looking around. Where's that perfect one? Where's the perfect one? You know what they should be doing? They should be looking at themselves. They should turn, they should be looking in a mirror and, and getting that chase conversation. You know, so when that young, you know, uh, guys, guys, you think you're going to get away with this? You know, uh, Scott Free tonight? Guys, it works the same way with you. That godly young lady walks in, and, and, and she walks in the door, and she's like, hi, you know, who are you? I'm so-and-so. She's looking for a husband that can support her and lead her and, and raise a family and, and lead her family and her children, the people that she's going to love the most ever in her life. And she's looking in, and you're like, hi, I'm a loser. She's like, oh, what do you do for a living? Uh, 
oh, I, I, like now or last week or what? Or next week? What? What's the living? What, what, what was the question? What was your name? Would you like to get married to me and live a life of poverty and misery? I'm worse than an infidel. <laughs> look, look, kiddo, seriously, seriously. There are, there are godly young people out there and they're looking for something more than just a pretty face. They're out there. They're out there. And when they walk in the door, what are they going to see when they look at you? What are they going to see when they meet you? What are they going to hear when they hear your conversation? Will they give you a second look? Because look, they're not these types of people. These types of young people, they exist. I know who they are. I can name them. They're not, they, they're not looking for the outward. They're looking for the inward. So I would be, I would be doing nothing but sharpening myself and looking in a mirror and sharpening myself and doing what the Bible says that I'm supposed to do. You know, the first part of Proverbs 31 is talking about King Lemuel. It's talking about the man and what he needs to do. Stay away from alcohol. Stay away from this stuff. Start getting your life together. And then think about praying. Here's all you got to do. Fix yourself. Pray for God to send you somebody, and it'll be done. That's it. You're looking in the wrong direction. All you kids are looking in the wrong direction. You look at yourself, you fix yourself according to what the Word of God says, and then you pray to God, and He's just going to make that happen. Because if you're a wreck, don't forget, God loves the other person too. God's not going to send some godly young lady that just loves the Lord and have her marry some train wreck. He loves her too. I mean, come on. You've got to think about this from a perspective other than just yourself. John 15, 7. Abide in Him. And then pray. And then pray. That means you do your part. Obey Him. Then pray. God will take care of the rest. Then you, then look, then you got a chance. Then you got a chance at a great, wonderful life with a, with a wonderful spouse. That's what God wants for you. God will answer that prayer. But you've got to look in the mirror. So, there's two sides to the coin, folks. You know, who you marry, it's the one single decision. Maybe, maybe the one single decision that will have the most impact on your entire life on this earth. Look, you're saved, you're always going to be saved, but man, who you marry. That's a big one, folks. So don't take relationship advice from Samson. Because he didn't have this one figured out. God still used him to judge the Philistines, and we're going to see that in the next couple chapters. But the man had some issues. So we can see, we can learn good things and bad things from these stories in the Bible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.